Okay. Our game is the Bible Biblical Child Challenge. Um, so for this game, um, you get 40 points if you get gets it after clue one, uh, 30 points after two, 20 points after three, 10 points after four. You have to keep your own score. Um, put it in the chat. Um, we'll put your, if you got one, two, or three, don't put the answer in the chat because people might still be guessing on it. Um, Katie, you can watch the chat and tell me what's in there because I can't see it while I'm presenting. Okay. So, all right, you have to keep your own points. Some of these are hard, some of them are easy. First question, I was the oldest child in my family. Do you know who it was? <laughs> um, all right, next clue. I was separated from my parents during a trip to Jerusalem. That one, some of you might get it then. Number three, I worked in the family business. Number four, the person I called dad was not my real dad. Did everybody get this one? You got it? It was Jesus. Well, can you tell us how, can you go back and tell us again how to do the points just in case somebody now understands if you what guessed it? If you guessed it right after one, you get 40 points. If you guessed it after two, you get 30. If you guessed it at three, 20, four, 10. Okay. So it's like decrease, decreasing points. Cool. So that was the easy question, everybody. <laughs> all right, here we go. Um, oh, I can't see all this. Hold on. Um, Wait, how does the point system work? If you guess it after the very first clue, you get 40 points. If it took you to the second one, you get 30 and then... 20 and then 10. Does that make sense? So like here, if you knew who this was, my dad sent his servant to another country to find a wife for me. If and you, you just knew it. who that was, you'd get 40 points. So second one, my mom should be in the Guinness Book of World Records for the oldest woman ever to give birth <laughs> to a child. Hmm. Number three, I obeyed my father even when he put me on the altar to offer me as a sacrifice to God. Terrible story. Four, my mother laughed when an angel told my father that she was going to have a child. Anybody get this? Is there anything in the chat? No. Oh, that one? Yeah, it's hard. That was Isaac. Remember the sacrifice of Isaac on the mountain? All right, so next one. Um, I have a little bit of a challenge because it goes right under my... Okay, when I was born, there was already a death warrant issued for me. I was the youngest captain ever to, oh, to navigate a vessel on the Nile River. Nile River is a clue. Number three, after I was born, my mother hid me for three months. Number four, I was only able to live with my parents for a few years before I went to live at Pharaoh's palace. I am, you got this? Moses. Did anybody get it? Anybody get any points? Yep. Yeah. Oh, Ezra got it. Okay. Yeah, Ezra, you're one, the one person on my screen I can see. <laughs> um, okay, Perry. next. I, have a, I had a twin brother. Okay. My brother was a hunter, but I like to stay close to home. Oh, think early in the Bible. I deceived my father so that he would give me the blessing of the firstborn, even though I was born second. Hmm. I tricked my brother into giving me the birthright for a bowl of beans. All right, buddy, get this one. It is Jacob, the two brothers, Jacob and Esau. Anybody get that one? <laughs> Peter did, he said, Bible dude. All right, nice. Okay, next one. An angel told my mom she was going to have a child. Then he came back and told my <coughs> dad as well. 
Number two, the angel told my parents that I was to be a Nazarite. That means I couldn't eat great products, touch dead bodies, or cut my hair. That's a clue. Back her head. Number three, my dad tried to get a wife for me, but she was given to someone else. What is it? Or after I gave away the secret of my strength, my hair was cut and my eyes were gouged out. Lovely. Anybody get that one? It is Samson. You know Samson's strength. All right, next one. Katie, did you make up these questions? No. My oldest sibling <coughs> died seven days after he, she was born. Wow, I don't know that one. Number two, a prophet was sent to my father to point out his sin after he committed adultery with my mother. Um, my dad was Israel's second king. I was Israel's third king. King. Ooh, we did that Bible history, remember? Yeah. My dad wrote most of the book of Psalms. I wrote most of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and a song that bears my name. Wow. Anybody get this? It is Solomon. Anybody get it? No? I don't think so. All right. Next one. I'll go faster. I had 11 brothers and one sister. I had two dreams in which I saw my parents and brothers bowing down to me. I was an ex-slave, ex-convict, and foreigner who rose to a position of power in Egypt. I was my dad's favorite son, and he gave me a highly decorated coat known as the coat of many colors. You probably know this one. Somebody knows this one. It is Joseph. Anybody get that one? Uh, not in the chat, they didn't. Oh. All right. My parents died when I was young and I was raised by wolves. No, by my <laughs> uncle. Um, together, my uncle and I spoiled a plot to kill all the Jews in Persia. Wow, you really have to know your Bible to get these um, questions. Sure. My uncle spoiled a plot to assassinate the king. I won a beauty contest that was held by the king of Persia, and I became his queen. Answer, Esther. Anybody how many points does everybody have right now? Does anybody, how many, can you write it in the chat or hold up your hands like something? 1280. I don't know how you get 12. Uh <laughs> 40. Oh, that was the last question. 30. Oh, wow. Okay. 80. Does anybody have more than 80? Good job. All right. This uh, maybe just whets your appetite to learn some of these outrageous, scandalous stories. You thought you get it on Netflix. This Old Testament stuff. Right. You there. thought it was tame. No, you stories of people getting their eyes gouged out. Um, all right. Well, before we jump into our, whoops, that's not what I want. Let me get rid of that one. <sighs> it's coming. It's coming. Here we go. Um, before I play from the start. Okay, let's just take a moment and deep breathe, have a deep minute of deep breathing and centering. It was a big day for our country. Um, lots of people feeling emotional today. Um, half the country was thrilled, half the country is disturbed. Um, so let's just pause and take a breath.
Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for today. We ask your blessing on this nation as it inaugurates a new president. We ask you to give wisdom to President Biden and Vice President Harris. We ask you to watch over the new Congress. Inspire a spirit of compromise and civility and kindness toward one another. Help us to work for freedom for everybody, especially the least. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so the theme for today's lesson is Jesus is our friend. Um, and if you remember, over the last couple weeks, we've talked about kind of an idea that to think about Jesus, we say two things at the same time, that Jesus is fully, totally human, and that Jesus is fully, totally divine at the very same time. Um, now, this is a idea, it's a great idea, it's a good way for us to describe who Jesus is, to understand who he is, but what does that really mean for us? And I think saying those two things really means that the idea of Jesus is something about a relationship. It's not about, Jesus isn't, the idea of Jesus isn't about trying to describe this kind of God human person. And if you just describe him right, yay, you're a good Christian and everything's okay. The whole point of it is so that we can have, we can relate to Jesus and um, that we relate to God as a friend. The whole point of Jesus being fully human and Jesus being fully divine is so that we can become friends with God. Jesus is our friend. Um, on the very last night that Jesus was with his disciples, he was trying to describe to them what their relationship was like. And um, they tended to think about their relationship as kind of Jesus being like uh more in charge, kind of giving direction on how they should be kind of their master, so to speak. Um, and following him meant obeying him. And Jesus said, no, that's not exactly how I think about it because I'm about love and that really changes things. So this is what Jesus said to them on his very last night. This is the night before he was crucified, the night where they shared the meal together and they're in the room and he's trying to describe to them what's coming. He says, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends, which is what Jesus is just about to do. You are my friends, if you do what I command, I'm no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. Jesus sort of saying, you know, I'm, I'm like you in a lot of ways. Everything I know about God, I have now passed on to you. You have access to God in the same way that I did. Um, and this was a radical idea at the time, to think of yourselves as intimate, close relationship with God. God not above and far away, but, you know, in community, in relationship. I want to tell you about one of my favorite churches, which is out in San Francisco. It's called St. Gregory of Nyssa. It's an Episcopal church. Um, and their patron saint is St. Gregory of Nyssa. And he said, we consider becoming God's friend the only thing worthy of honor and desire. This, as I have said, is the perfection of 
life. Notice the difference. It's not about being good or following all the rules or understanding the right, idea, right ideas. It's about friendship. It's about relationship. Partly what I love about St. Gregory's in San Francisco, this is a picture of their church and all painted around the dome are what they call all the friends of God, the saints of God. They're all kind of doing this big circle dance together. Um, what I wanted to show you about it that I really like, um, here's a close up of some of these dancing saints. And I just want you to look at the diversity of these faces. Basically the way they think of the friends of God is way bigger than a lot of people do. If you notice like, look, there's a, a, Native, <clears throat> a Native American dancing with Jesus who may not have known anything about Jesus as a person, but his love for the earth spoke to what Jesus was about. All these people lived in a way that Jesus would have loved, regardless of where they came from. There, see, there's a Chinese woman there on the, the top. Um, down in the bottom row, I love, there's a tiger in the picture. They see animals as part of being friends with God. Anybody who's living life in the way that Jesus lived life is a friend of God, a partner with, with Jesus. Um, so I like thinking about the people we meet that way, that if people are about sort of the work of love in the world, whether it's compassion or peace or justice, those are really the friends of Jesus. And those are the people we're called to relate to and partner with so that we're all sharing that, that good work. Um, I think saying that we're friends with Jesus also means, um, and this is maybe something you'll do in your small groups when you get together, is think about what are all the things that friends do? Um, what's a good friend supposed to do? If you make a list of those, all of those things are the things that Jesus does for us. Um, and uh, you can make a good list of that when you're in your, in your groups. Um, so I think part of what we do as we are Christians and growing up and thinking about what does it mean to be a more mature uh, Christian person, um, which is what all of you are doing in your confirmation um, time, is to think what is what does my faith look like to me? Um, all of us are challenged to think about how do we develop our friendship with Jesus? What does it mean to be close to Jesus? Um, to give time, trust, talking, just talking to Jesus. Um, I wanted to tell you one story. I Years ago, I was going through a really difficult time in my life, and I uh, started seeing a therapist during that time to just kind of figure out what was going on inside of me, what was my place in the world. And um, she knew that I was Lutheran and I was a Christian person. So sometimes we talked about faith in our sessions. And she, when uh, particularly one time I was talking about just feeling so alone, like um, that no one really understood what I was going through. And I was afraid to talk about that with people. Um, and partly I thought I was the only one struggling, which now I know as an adult was kind of crazy. Everybody was struggling with the same thing, but I didn't know that at the time. But she said, well, here's what I want you to do. I want you to just go sit somewhere and imagine that Jesus is sitting next to you and picture him, close your eyes and picture him next to you and then picture him putting his arm around you and saying, I understand what you're going through. I love you. I'm with you. Um, 
And so I remember going on this walk after that session and I found this park bench and I sat down. I didn't close my eyes because I didn't want anybody to think I was being too weird, like, you know, faith that anybody could see, God forbid. Um, but I sat there and I, I did what she said. And it was this really powerful experience for me because I did experience the presence of Jesus near me. And that was really comforting to me. Um, and truthfully, I still kind of do this. Um, just last night, I had a really tough part of my day yesterday. And it kind of, there was a part I just couldn't go to sleep because I kept thinking about it. And so I just said to myself, Jesus, just be with me and give me your peace right now. I need to rest. I need to put this down. I can't keep carrying this and I need you to help me. Um, next thing you know, the alarm went off um, and I woke up that somehow in my, my praying there in the dark, I fell asleep. And I think that was because of the peace, the peace of Jesus. Um, so that's kind of the end of my little talk. Um, but to encourage you to think about what your relationship with Jesus is, how do you talk to Jesus? How do you trust that he's there for you? It looks different in all our lives. We're all friends of God in different ways because we're all different people. You know, every friendship is different because we're different. So uh, I invite you to think about that yourself. So Katie. Thank you all. Very good. Thank you, Pastor Bradley. And just sort of like a thought for everybody, if you are just at a place in your faith and belief, your walk with God, where you're like, I do not know God that personally. I have no idea what you're talking about. It just takes one time to have a conversation. Just give it a shot someday when you have some time just to reach out like that. It's pretty powerful. Tonight, after your small group's at 7.30, oh, you don't get a treat if you do that, buddy. I'm not rewarding that. Barking. Um, we're going to play Among Us if you want. We're going to probably half hour, 40 minutes. So if you want to come back at 7.30 in the main room here. We'll play among us. I have your groups. We have kind of, we have enough adults tonight that we'll do a little bit like there's five, six, seven of you in a group. So I really hope and expect that students participate. We're going to ask in your small groups if there's any way that you'd be brave enough to put your uh, camera on. So we're trying to help people build some relationships and uh, it helps if you have your camera on if possible. If you don't like how your hair looks, just put on your favorite hat, man. Don't worry about it. We're not even, who cares? And uh, we're glad that you're here. It means a lot. So I'm praying for you and we'll see you next time.